Civic journey actually got started almost a year ago while uh, myself and a couple of friends were running from uh, Shimla to Manali. We did a 700 kilometer run through the Spiti and the Pangi valleys. When somewhere uh, midway we saw like a big board by the Himachal Tourist uh, Development Corporation that uh, showed us various passes actually, various trails uh, shortcutting in between uh, different valleys. So that time uh, I was thinking like we have been running like so many years in the Himalayas from on the roads, the main roads from town to town, which is easy for stay and uh, food. But why not actually try running across the passes, uh, very remote places that directly take us uh, on shortcut trails between the different valleys. So it took us weeks and weeks of reading through blogs, uh, checking uh, trails available in open street maps. Um, Google Maps does not have uh, trails, they mostly uh, keep it to uh, roads. So it created one uh, big map that uh, would give us sufficient actually uh, route. This time the focus was really to keep it light. So we have a background now for more than five years on ultra running where we try to minimize the gears. So we came to around five kilograms on the back, uh, excluding food. It's always a bit unknown, the planning, as many of the passes were new to us, all were actually new. So we didn't know exactly you cannot just look at distance, uh, uh, it's all about how many hours, how many days uh, are you going to need to cross these various types of terrain. At every altitude you actually have a different type of terrain, vegetation, uh, depending on the alt I mean, altitude and weather conditions. So typically as you start from valleys below 2000 meters you walk through dense uh, forests. Somewhere above 3000 meters you come into alpine meadows, uh, a lot of beautiful lush green meadows with uh, a variety of flowers. <laughs> as you go above uh, 4000 meters again you will uh, hit uh, kind of the beyond alpine zone where you actually no vegetation is left, you'll have rocks and moraines. The rocks kind of are uh, sitting on top of a melting glacier, so they kind of tumble inside. And um, it's very risky as you jump from rock to rock, uh, many of the rocks are loose. And as you uh, land on a rock, uh, the rock gives away sometimes, it is very kind of uh, unbalanced. If you go further beyond that, then you come in Iceland basically, snow and glaciers more risky or more dangerous uh, items which you will come on, on like a trans Himalayan journey. One is, I would say, the landslides. It's very tricky there. You need to really hold on with all uh, four of your hands and legs on, on whatever still protrudes from the slope of the valley to cross those sections, sometimes hundreds of meters before the uh, valley. I mean, before again, you come onto steady soil. So landslides are very dangerous because there one wrong step on a loose stone actually ends you up like hundreds of meters below in the, in the valley floor. Another one are the stream crossings uh, which, which have high water currents, not always easy to see. Just looking at the stream might look peaceful, but as you go inside, say, the depth of the stream might actually go even be beyond your waist. But as the sun uh, sets high in the afternoon, and uh, the amount of glacial water increases. And in, in one specific section where we crossed from Chandratal to Barachala, there we had a challenge of crossing like three major side streams on one side of the main valley. And really the stream was very ferocious where you could hear big rocks being pushed uh, through the stream, banged on each other. So it was like a very risky uh, thing to try to cross those. We pitched up the tent before the stream to uh, make the crossing in the morning when the water level 
should be uh, much less than uh, right now. You can hear the thundering sound outside. Good night. Good night, everybody. Slowly, slowly, slowly. Keep coming, slowly. <laughs> I tripped and I was just hanging on my life with this finger. Yeah. Anyway, it was too turbulent. Third danger would be again like crevices in the glaciers which uh, basically are made by meltwater in the summer sun, the afternoon sun. As you step uh, in this fresh snow you can actually see whether you're stepping on solid surface or on top of uh, some hollow crevice below. Fresh snow really um, kind of has this whiteout effect which covers everything including dangerous uh, obstacles and you might take a wrong step suddenly. So you always have to be a bit careful that you don't end up in some 127 hour experience. If you approach the glaciers, right, typically from the side where the slope is less rather than attacking it in the front where it's quite steep, that mostly the ice is quite rough and you can actually, you have actually a pretty good grip even with a normal uh, hiking shoe, you don't need any boots or spikes. If it becomes a little more slippery, you can make use of hiking poles actually to uh, kind of uh, have a better grip. We kind of always uh, set up like camp uh, towards the pass and then uh, try to quickly make it across the pass in the morning and then again come down uh, quite a bit of altitude so the next uh, night also we could camp at uh, somewhere below 3000 meters so it's first of all it's warmer and then people can also spend uh, the night at uh, lower altitude with uh, better oxygen reducing any effects of uh, high altitude sickness. Most people know the AMS, the high altitude uh, sickness. So we had carried a small device called an uh, oxygen meter. So having that uh, allowed us basically to keep an eye as we are crossing above 3,000, 3,500 meters. As uh, it can become very dangerous, uh, you also carefully, carefully watch the symptoms of AMS while climbing up. And then after some three, four, five days in spending in those higher altitudes, the body actually gets acclimatized. We are at 4,500 meters. Apparently it's quite the effort to even walk and we have been running. It looks like we are properly acclimatized now. Yeah. Uh, we definitely had a couple of sleepless nights when it was really cold, even with all those layers uh, inside the tent, with even two, three people inside the tent. Then also a couple of the guys uh, got excited in the Chandra Tal Lake to really uh, take a nice dip in uh, the beautiful high altitude uh, lake at 4,000 meters, but then... It was really cold in <laughs> That's what I was thinking. My heart is freezing. Taking baths and stuff was, was definitely challenging for people who are used to uh, Chennai type of climate. This was in Parvati Valley. Uh, at that time we were actually already soaking in two weeks of rainy weather. Pretty cold at those higher altitudes. Morning till evening it was kind of drizzly and rainy. We were feeling cold. And then coming across this beautiful open view hot spring, giving beautiful views on the opposite side of the mountain, submerging yourself in 60 degree water while it's just 5 degrees outside was like uh, really a heavenly feeling. So as we were walking uh, through those areas, from a distance we could see some pretty nice looking royal uh, kind of settlements, beautifully constructed. Then as we approached these uh, little hamlets, we could see that they were kind of fallen apart by the weather elements. And as we kind of entered these uh, places, we saw that people had left kind of in a hurry, uh, completely emptied, transformed in a beautiful, uh, vibrant little hamlets in the past had been transformed to ghost villages now. Seeing this so beautiful settlements actually now completely abandoned was giving a very uh, weird sense actually to walk around those uh, houses and, and see how vibrant living would have been there uh, in those uh, golden days. In Mashal, you could see more or less traces of wildlife, especially in Zanskar Ladakh was uh, herds of um, wild yaks. Uh, mostly, I mean, not hostile, as long as you don't make any sudden moves. 
groups of Ibex in, in many places. So there again you need to be a bit careful, those guys are very agile, they will be running up vertical slopes, so if they just be uh, on top of your location, you should be careful for uh, rocks coming down. Snow leopards definitely were there, so mostly in the remote places, far away from the villages and, and kind of the hiking routes. Shepherd dogs typically wear this big metal uh, uh, ring with spikes along the neck, uh, they will be protecting the, the herds, the sheep and the goat. Uh, against those uh, attacks of snow leopards. Black and brown bears. And apart from that, I only saw like one single snake in the entire journey. Buses are, has been a pretty convenient way for the hiker actually to, in a very low cost uh, way, to connect to the different passes. One of the buses also had some nice entertainment of a local boy and girl playing some beautiful kind of weird looking instrument, a kind of a combination of a guitar and a violin. I think I've been sitting in more buses in the last three months than in my entire life. <laughs> A lot of the shepherds coming from the lower Himalayas uh, take like big herds of sheep, five to seven hundred sheep, and go across various passes on their way to the higher alpine meadows where they actually let them graze. Uh, shepherds typically stay in pretty remote places, so whenever uh, they see a hiker there, especially in the non-touristic places, they are quite uh, happy to see a living soul and to meet a shepherd who kind of welcomes you warmly and immediately starts like milking the goat, preparing fresh tea. And they're always very friendly, I mean, uh, totally non-expecting. They will offer uh, shelter and food for free. They treat you really royally as a guest. Also sometimes when we were low on food, we were able to find a shepherd actually who gave us food. So as you hike for three, four days in no man's land, eating your chapatis, which become a little bit hard on the third day, and you're really looking forward to have some hot, uh, fresh food made in the town the first time you're in town you're meeting. And then typically some crispy, oily uh, momos uh, really did the job, sometimes with a Carlsberg or, or another beer. Overall, like hospitality as you go to more remote places, hospitality maybe uh, increases further um, compared to when you come closer to the bigger towns. You can see the change in uh, the mindset of the people. It's like a silent train, yeah. actually. Mm. I'm also kind of documenting all these experiences now on a blog. We'll be kind of uh, prioritizing the passes and uh, sorting them according to difficulty level. I want to share this with the world because I know uh, it took a lot of effort, weeks and weeks of, of quite technical research to identify these passes and, and the routes to these passes. Eventually we came to ultrajourneys.org where all 40 passes will be documented uh, in detail with maps, logs, a lot of photos and videos. I strongly suggest for people to first take it easy, go to some smaller easy passes which just take one or two days and then slowly scale up, just take it step by step and see whether you're ready for all these uh, different items. And once you come back to the civilized world, right, you're happy to be back with the friends, you feel okay, comfortable at home again. But again, it's only a matter of weeks again before you will start longing again to go towards uh, the mountains. So while you're there actually, you don't really feel like uh, returning home again because you feel so much peace and, and you every day is like an adventure. I think it's, it's a nice rhythm actually to like spend a couple of months in the wild, uh, go out and explore new places and then again come home for one or two months and again kind of uh, take it easy, have some good food, be in a comfort, comfortable place, uh, planning your next journey. Human soul is not meant to be caged, we're all born free souls. <laughs>